morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? Oh man, come on. This is an awesome, awesome day today. So we need a little more energy than that because we're here to worship God and what a an amazing opportunity that is. I, I don't know if you saw on Facebook, I said, you know, we love Sundays because every Sunday's different. And it is, and that's what makes church so special. Uh, and our prayer is that God's presence shows up, that the Holy Spirit will stir us up this morning as we worship Him. But we're so thankful that you're here with us. If you are visiting with us, you are an honored guest. Thank you for being here. If you're watching online, if you're ever in the area, come by and see us. A um, couple things, and we'll get right into our worship. Um, tonight, this afternoon, 4 o'clock, our fall festival. If you have signed up for a car trunk, be here by 3.30 before we can block everything off there. Have everything ready by 3.50 and we're getting kicked off at 4 o'clock. Super, super excited for that. Super excited to see all the trunks. Cannot wait till afterwards to taste all the chili and all the pies. So that's going to be awesome. I've got the golden spoons ready for the winter. Plus we've got some gift certificates for the winter also. And so we're super, super excited about that. One other thing I'd like to mention, I'm going to ask Mike and Ann to stand up back here. Mike and Ann has been visiting with us. I'll let you sit down. I won't embarrass you too long. Mike and Ann, I think May 19th or so was one of their first visits down here that I remember. And uh, they're coming in from Madison, Alabama. Uh, but they got moved in a couple weeks ago. And they, they met with the elders and want to call Spanish Fork their church home. So we're super excited about that. And we're going to have a word of prayer with them. And then we'll have scripture reading right after the prayer. Would you pray with me? Our most graceful and all wise Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the many blessings. But Father, I want to thank you for the Owens. Just thank you for... The smiles they bring every time they've been here with us. Just thank you for the conversations that we've had with them. And Father, we're so excited that they want to be part of this wonderful church family here. And Father, we just pray that we can be an example to them as their example to us as we work in the kingdom together. Because they're a race that is set out before us. And let us all run the race that is set out. Father, thank you for just blessing us with, with this family. And Father, I pray that this family is always doing things in a way to bring honor and glory to your wonderful name. Father, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Welcome to the family. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Let's stand for these next songs, please.
Let us pray to our God. Holy God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning giving you thanks that we can call you Father. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that we know comes from thy hands. And Father, most of all, we give you thanks for the love that you had that you would give your son for us. And that through his sacrifice and through his life and death and, and resurrection that we can have a hope to have a home with you forever because he has washed away our sins by the giving of his blood. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together, that we can share together, that we can worship you, that we can praise you. And Father, we would ask that you would be with us in our worship this morning, in our praise to you, in our prayers, in all that we do, that we might be pleasing to you and glorify you. Father, we thank you for this congregation and the leaders thereof. We ask you to bless our leaders in, in Berlin and, and uh, uh, as they lead us, as they teach us, as they give us and show us the way that we would uh, be pleasing unto you. Help us, Father, to adhere to the ways that you have given unto us uh, by the life of your Son. And may we look to his life and, and the way that he lived uh, upon this earth. And, and Father, because he was tempted as we are, we too can overcome sin by your help and by the help of, of your son. Father, we thank you for this country that we live in, for the freedoms that we have, and especially the freedom that we have to, to come together and to worship you in, in times such as these. Father, help us to always have this freedom, uh, to not take it lightly, but Father, know that it comes with a price. We thank you for those that have given uh, their lives in, in, in service to you, uh, in service to us, in protecting us and giving us uh, the freedom that we have to, to serve you each day of our lives. Father, we ask you to, to continue to be with those that uh, are sick among us, those that are going through the issues of life, the troubles and trials that we encounter here uh, while we are on this earth. Father, be with them and give them uh, comfort as, as only you can. Father, strength that only can come from you. Father, give them recovery if it be your will. Father, we ask you to be with us uh, not only through this time of worship, but as we leave here that we can truly be good servants of yours to show the love that you have for mankind through our actions to, to one another and to those that we meet. Guide us in your paths. For it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by. Thank you. 
Good morning. As I was working up something to say this morning, I was going through several different thoughts, and I was uh, I was getting a little frustrated because I I didn't really want to say the things that I had been thinking about recently, <clears throat> and it's we spend a really good portion of our lives. Um, thinking and feeling like we are immortal, and then we spend another really good portion of our lives trying to forget that we are only temporary. And having kids is this really new, amazing marker of time for me, and it's wonderful. I don't want to miss uh, any of it, but I also can't help that it reminds me of the inevitable. I can feel how fleeting it is, this life. And I know, I know you can too. And I know that this isn't what anybody ever wants to talk about, um, because we are uncomfortable anytime we are confronted with the great and original enemy, death. And I know I'm young, and what do I know? But I don't want to shy away from this feeling. I don't want to ignore it. Because I don't want to wait until I am departing to be truly thankful that Christ has overcome death and that I will be redeemed. And if I keep numbing myself and not breathing in his spirit, and if I keep trying to forget that I am just a vapor, I will also forget how big a sacrifice it is that we are celebrating this morning. And with that in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we are so thankful that we are able to proclaim, O death, where is your sting? Father, I pray that we would forgive one another of our sins just as you have forgiven us of our sins. God, as we Take this bread this morning. I pray that you would be with us all and help us to internalize this great sacrifice that you have made for us with your son's body who who hung on that cross. That's in his name we pray. Amen. I have a notebook that I keep all kinds of thoughts like these in, and when I was trying to figure this out, I was just flipping through it, flipping through it, flipping through it, and because, again, this is not what I wanted to talk about, but I did come on to just one thing that I'd written down. I don't know who said it, but it was, good people don't go to heaven, only the forgiven go to heaven. And this blood is how we got that. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the blood that was shed for us. God, I pray that this morning we would we would reflect on how temporary we are here in this world, but that we could also rejoice because this blood has wiped us clean. God, be with us all as we take it. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
give everybody some time to get prepared in the back, but this is the time that we've usually set aside um, to make an offering, um, to give something back to the church so that we can continue to be doing the amazing work that has brought everybody here this morning. Um, and I pray that we would be mindful of that and thoughtful and that whatever it is that you've set aside to give money or even your time and your labor, because there is a lot of labor as well, that you would do so intentionally and thoughtfully. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for how blessed we are here in this life. God, it is because of how blessed we are that we are so desperate to not let go. Father, help us to remember that eternity is with you and that we will be redeemed and that these things that we have now are just for now. Father, be with us all as we give this morning. I pray that we would do so with your work in mind. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
when Jesus said, unless you become like these little children. I think he meant in their excitement even to give is part of that. Uh, to me, that is one of the most heartfelt time of our worship service to see how excited these kids get to give. What an amazing thing. So parents, thank you for teaching your kids and what an amazing opportunity it is to worship with our kids like that. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll jump into our message. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we've had to worship you. But Father, thank you for the opportunity now to open up your word as we continue in this series of choices that we make in our everyday life. Father, we just pray that this everything that we say here this morning is according to your word and well pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Last week, we talked about breaking bad. And what I mean by breaking bad, I'm talking about the bad habits that we all have. And we said how do we break the bad is start planning good. And I want to pick up right where we left off last week and carry it a little further. Because remember our goal when we started this um, four weeks ago. We said we were around 87 days until January 1st. And we said so many times people wait to January 1st and they make these New Year's resolutions. We try to say, this is who I want to be by the end of the year and so forth. We said, what would it be like instead of waiting to January 1st, what if we go in and we launch into uh, January 1st, 2025, a new person to start with? What difference would that make? And so we want to hit full stride. We're 65 days away from January 1st. So we've understand, and we'll talk about this even more, it takes anywhere from 21 to 64 days to start a new habit. So we're within that 66 days. And so we have that opportunity. The verse that was read for us this morning in Hebrews chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded... By such a great cloud of witnesses, and I love this, let us throw off, let us get rid, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangle us and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, my question for you this morning as we begin this is we all have a dream. We all have goals. We all have a destiny. What is it that is standing between you and you getting to your destiny, your dream that you really want to do? Because the Bible says there in Hebrews 11 or 12 that the race is marked out for us. The race is there. What is it that is keeping us from winning this race, getting to the finish line? The way that God wants us to do. What do you need to do to, or what do you need to have in place, if you will, to really go in to 2025, the man, the woman that God wants you to be this coming year? Last week we found out that in order to have a transformed life, we needed to have a transformed mind. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world. We learned last week, the New Living Translation says, don't copy. So do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So today we're in part four of this series, and what we want to do is talk about how to birth good habits, and how do we go about that. And when we look at this, I want us to really see where we're at, how we're going to get there, how can we truly build these habits that we need to have. The word habit tends to have negativity around it. When we say, well, I just have this habit, we just think automatically it's a bad habit. But there's good habits that you do on a daily basis that you do without even thinking about it. You just do it because it's there, and that's awesome. 
And our thing is to change those bad habits into good habits. Now think about this. Maybe it's just the good habits have just become part of our DNA, and maybe it's become part of our character. It's just natural all the time. Maybe it's as simple as putting on a seatbelt when you get in your car. You know, that's a habit. I, I'm going to, I'll be very transparent. I, I used to hate wearing a seatbelt. I hated it with a passion. And my wife would get so aggravated with me because we'd get in the vehicle and she would buckle up and we'd start down the road and ding, ding, ding. That thing, was, I was going out, I was going to beat that ding because I was going to last longer than it. Ginger, your seatbelt's not fastened. I know that. The car knows that. We'll see who wins this battle. And for years, I would not wear a seatbelt. But then I realized, just as the story we talked about, the young man or the father in Texas that left and was the only one that did not wear a seatbelt, was the only one injured in that car wreck. Started thinking about that, and now it's just natural. It's to the point now, if it dings, I look at Ginger and say, why ain't your seatbelt fastened? Because I know mine's already fastened. How the tables turns, because they will turn in a heartbeat like that. Maybe it's um, a habit, uh, you know, oh my goodness, I, I may get in trouble here. I'm going to do both sides. That way, neither people can be too, truly mad at me. Husbands, to start with to us, it, it's a habit to pull, put that toilet seat down. All right? That becomes a habit. But on the other end, women, it's a habit for you to lift the toilet seat up too for us guys. Depends how it goes. You think about, well, you know, it's, it's just a natural thing. You say, I cannot believe the preacher's talking about toilet seats today. You never know what you'll hear from me. But it's a habit, some things that we don't even think about. A habit that I have, I always open doors for people. And sometimes Ginger will be already out in the car and I'm still holding the door open for somebody. It's just a habit. I try to teach my boys that. This is a habit you need to do. Another habit I have that is probably one of my favorite habits is every morning when I pull out of my driveway, I cover my wife and my family in prayers as I'm leaving the house. That's just what I do. If someone calls me as I'm leaving, I will not answer the phone because that's my time to cover my family in prayer. And so as we go into 2025, and as we get ready for this and we start looking, what are some of the bad habits that we want to kick? What, how can we go into 2025 clean and free? How can we start some or birth some good, healthy habits in our life? What is it that you want to build in your life? They say that habits form from anywhere from 21 days to 64 days. So some takes longer to form than others, but 21 days is where the habit will start. So what am I willing to do? Am I willing to do this? Am I willing to maybe sacrifice? One of the things that, um, that I, I decided today, I told my wife this morning, my wife is, uh, someone asked, and let me go ahead and tell you, she's in Gulfport, Mississippi. My son and their church is having friend and family day, so she's visiting with them today. But I told her, I said, okay, last night was my last Dr. Pepper for a while. I said, I'm going back to drinking water. It's going to take me a while. Bryson, call me out if you see me, one in the office. 21 days. Yes, this is water. I do not like just plain water, so I put a little wild strawberry in there. And so how many days will it take? Are we willing to do this? We're 66 days before the new year, so we've got plenty of time to get in it. You think about New Year's resolutions, because so many of us have different New Year's resolutions that we do, and so we've got to look at it and say, what am I willing to do? How am I willing to do this? Let me give you just a few of the New Year's resolutions that happen, that people make. A few of these, maybe it's what you hit. Well, I'm going to eat better this year. I'm going to lose weight this year. I, I'm going to get out of debt this year. I'm, I'm going to do less electronics this year. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to get more organized. These are some of the top New Year's resolutions. Well, so let me give you a few facts here on habits. Number one, habits are part of God's design. 
but the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now understand, God is the one who made our brains the way they are. God created us. He formed us. And so he meant for these habits to be good and healthy habits to help lead us to the success that God wants us to have. But just like a lot of things, the devil comes in and take what God meant to be for good and try to make it bad. And so he comes in and he tries to steal from us what God wanted for good. And you think about your bad habits. And here's, I, I don't even have to ask, do you have bad habits? Because we all have bad habits. When it comes to our bad habits, think about it. It steals. Our bad habits steals money. It steals our time. It steals our relationships that we have. Our bad habits cost us. Number two, habits will help you or hurt you. Habits will help you or hurt you. Habits will take you forward in life or they will put you in reverse in your life. One or the other. It's our choice. Do we choose good ones that's going to help move us forward to bring glory to God? Or are we going to have these bad habits that's going to set us back a few steps? Again, it is our choice. They're going to either work for you or they're going to work against you. And what we're going to learn today is how to give birth to new and healthy habits. Because here's what takes place. Habits emerge because the brain is always looking for ways to be more efficient. Therefore, when it sees a repetitive behavior, it moves that action out of the conscious to subconscious. Important to see that because you think about your morning routine. We all have a morning routine. Maybe it changes a little on the weekend, but it's normally the same on Sunday because it's every Sunday. Maybe it's the same every morning that you work. You don't have to say, okay, what am I going to do next? One of the things I do is when I wake up, I do not get straight up. I spend time meditating on God. I'm praying to God even before I get out of bed. I want to start my day out right. I do that every morning. The, if it's alarm clock or if I just wake up, either way, that's the first thing I do before I even step out of bed. I don't then step out of bed and say, oh my goodness, I am so lost. What do I do? It just becomes a routine. And so it's just automatic for us. We go into what we would call autopilot. What this is called and where this works in the brain, it's called basal gang ganglia. And it is a middle part of your brain, kind of in the lower part of the brain there. And what it does, it is the, um, helps us from the sense of processing and deciding. Uh, the brain creates what we call a shortcut. And that's what's happening here, to save brain activity. And so when we wake up in the morning, whatever time it may be, you're getting ready in the morning, you're ready to go, we all tend to follow that same routine. We have a schedule. We do it without even consciously asking ourselves, again, what am I going to do next? We just do it. For example, driving to the office during the week. I get in my car, I back up, I'm praying over my family, and there's times that I'm driving down the road, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm already at church? Why? I don't think, okay, I've got to turn right at this stop sign, I've got to turn left at this next stop sign, I've got to turn right, go past the elementary school, down and around the hill, come to the red light, stop at the red light, they get in trouble, you get in trouble if you don't, take a left, now I'm on this road, now you're going to hit school traffic on 31, and so I've got to watch, I don't think that. I'm in autopilot because I do it every morning. And so there's a shortcut there, and now I don't use as much brain activity. There's a man by the name of Eugene. Eugene was a memory patient back in the 1990s. He had a severe uh, memory loss from an accident that he had. He could only retain things for about two minutes. After two minutes, he forgot everything that you even told him, everything that he's ever seen there. But one of the things that happened 
is that his wife, at the same time, at 9 o'clock, every morning, they would go out and do a two-mile walk around their neighborhood. They would go the exact same route every morning. Every morning at 9 o'clock, they would go. Well, one morning, the wife woke up, and she was not feeling good. And so she told Eugene, she said, Eugene, I, I can't walk this morning. And so for two minutes, he realized she, she's not going to walk. And probably in his mind, what do you mean, walk? But at 9 o'clock, he went out the front door without her knowing it. And she came into the living room where she thought she was because, again, she was not feeling good. And it was about 9.30 or so, and he was gone. And she starts just freaking out. She didn't know what was going on. She was just worried to death. And a few minutes later, Eugene came walking in the door. Now understand, you could ask Eugene, where do you live? He couldn't tell you his address. But yet, he had been doing this same routine for years. Even though he had memory loss, even though he could not retain things, it was an automatic thing. He walked his two miles and came back home. Why? Because a habit was formed. Studies show that up to 40% of our daily function is directed by our habits. That's a lot of power, whether it's for good or where it's for evil. And so what if we created healthy, godly, and biblical habits in our life? Do you realize coming to church is a habit? Without a doubt. I've seen it happen too many times. People will come to church, and all of a sudden they miss church for whatever reason. Whether it's work, whether they're sick, whatever it may be. And they're like, man, I cannot believe I missed Sunday. It just, it, it hurt me to miss. The next thing you know, they miss next Sunday. Well, I cannot, oh man, that's two weeks in a row. Then third week, oh, was it Sunday? Fourth week, it, it becomes a habit of not coming to church. I remember growing up. You didn't have sports on Wednesday nights. You didn't have sports on Sundays. It didn't happen. Everything worked around church. Why? Because everybody was in that habit. That's the Lord's day. We're going to do this. And that's not what happens today. And so we've got to be careful and understand the habits we are forming. How are we doing this in our life? Now, as we read through the book of Hebrews, as we looked at the verse there in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2 there, as we talked about that, I want you to see, we throw off the things that entangles us. We have to throw them off. In other words, we need a brain makeover. In order to have a brain makeover, we need to build healthy habits in our life so we can race, we can run the race that God has set out for us. Am I willing to do that? In Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 18, it says, For as I have often told you before, and now I tell you again, even with tears. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Let's, let's pause. I want to read that again because I want you to see and I want you to understand the urgency as he says this and the heartfelt that he's saying here. For as often as I've told you before now, even with tears in my eyes, many, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. It's one of the things we, we read in 1 Corinthians 11, a, a verse, the passage that's used a lot when it comes to the Lord's Supper. And it talks about doing a self-examination. We need an audit. We need to examine ourselves. As a coach, I, I, I was a defensive coordinator for years, and what we would do is the offensive coordinator would scout my defense as I would scout his defense because I needed to know, where's my weaknesses? Where am I failing? What are my strengths? 
And so we need to do that. Right now, we need to scout our, our life. We need to do an audit and see, am I, am I, am I, is my mind set on earthly things or on heavenly things? Because the more disciplined we are in our habits, the more productive our life will be. When we build these healthy habits into our life, it will cause us to be more productive. We become highly disciplined. We become less stressed, and we reap greater rewards in our life. So how can we reach our full potential for the glory of God? Colossians chapter 2 and verse 5. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit. Delight To see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Why is it that some people are more successful than others? Why is it that things are happening in people's lives? They have built their character. They have built their habits and their traits that allows them to succeed. Do we seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And all these things will be added. Do we put God first in our lives? And I believe most all of us want to succeed. I believe that's our heart's desire. I believe all of our heart's desire is to bring glory to God's name in all that we do. So do we build the habits to be able to do that? Because most people... Most are willing to change in order for success to be possible. I had a conversation at Walmart yesterday with a gentleman from another church, and we was discussing some things, and he was talking, was honestly, was talking about football. He started church, and we started talking about some football stuff, and one of the things that was discussed there is some of the issues was something that was going on, but yet no one was willing to admit and willing to make the changes that need to be made. There's a problem. That's a big problem. I I tell you right now, my encouragement to you, and I apologize because I don't think I've said this since I've been here, but this has been something I've said for 28 years in my ministry. Take home what you hear me say, from the pulpit here, study it further. Make sure it lines up with God's word. If it doesn't, come and talk to me. Because that's what it's about. We've got to be able to talk. If you have a problem with something I say, come and talk to me. Let's discuss it. It may be something sometimes, I don't know if you've ever been in this position, sometimes things come out quicker than you can hold them back. You're like, ooh, that probably didn't come out right. And if I say something wrong, I will apologize in a heartbeat. Are we willing to examine ourselves? There's a book that I've read called The Power of Habit. Why do we do what we do and how to change? How does the habit work? And and I want to share just quick insights from this book that I got and apply it to us in a spiritual way. Back in the 1990s, they were actually able to attach a probe to a rat's brain without everybody going nuts over that. And so they would track his brain activity to learn the habits that was formed. And so they put him in a a little tea maze here. And you had a gate there. And the gate was holding back. And at the end of the tea was nothing was to the right. And then there was chocolate to the left. And so as they got set and as the click would happen, the rat would hear the click, the door would open. Now, the first time down the maze, the rat's brain activity was at its peak. It was sniffing, it was looking, it was searching, it was smelling. And so the brain activity was at a peak. And at the end of the tunnel, he went both ways. He explored both ways before eating the chocolate. They repeated this activity over and over and over again. And the more they repeated the event, the greater the change in the brain activity. When the click would happen, 
brain activities would shoot up. But as soon as the rat started down the maze, the brain activity went down. Almost to the same activity as when the rat was asleep. And he would go straight down and take a left. And then when he started in on the chocolate, the brain activity would go up. You say, well, what does that mean? It became a habit. It became a routine that he did it without even thinking. It didn't cause. The brain has created a shortcut. And so it just did it. It no longer had to um, process the path. It became automatic, autopilot. And so I get it. What does a rat and all this have to do with church? What, all, what does it have to do with my faith? What does it have to do with Christianity? I am so glad you asked because I wanted to tell you that. And so here's what it is. Too often we function on autopilot in our own lives with our bad habits. We say, well, it's just the way I am. This is just the way that God made me. And when we do that, we're, we've got to understand, we've got to break those bad habits. And so we see through this study of what's going on that we've got to break the bad and begin to build healthy new habits. We renew our mind to God's word, our faith, decisions, and choices will become automatic response, rather debating, should I or shouldn't I? You know, we talked about this, and I appreciate some of your feedback uh, over the last few weeks that uh, I had someone tell me this morning, I won't call no names or nothing, and won't call the situation, but they said, I was about to make this big purchase. I was so excited about this purchase, and I realized, huh, is this the wise thing to do? And they said, and I did not make the purchase. Because I thought I wanted this, but was it the wise thing to do? The choices that we make. And here's what I want, and I think this is what we all want. I want my faith to be a habit. I, I want it to be a habit that I don't have to question, is God going to come through on it? I know God's going to come through it. I know that Jesus says, I will never leave nor forsake you, and I believe that. Why? Because God continues to answer prayers. God continues to show me all of his promises. I want my prayer life to be a habit. I don't want to get to a point and say, oh my goodness, I cannot believe it's come to this. I guess I need to pray. No, prayer is a habit. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to be in prayer uh, daily about everything in my life. I want forgiveness to be a habit in my life. Well, <laughs> my goodness, Mark, you've hurt me twice already, buddy. I'll give you a week, and then we'll see if I forget. No. It needs to be a habit. I want that. I want generosity to be a habit. I want excellent. I, I want to be excellent in everything I do. I want that to be a habit. I don't want to be average. Because here's the thing: average is as close to the bottom as it is to the top. I want our worship services to be excellent for the glory of God. We should want everything we do for God to be excellent. And that should be a habit. I love how the message puts Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9. It says, slack habits and sloppy work are as bad as vandalism. Now, when it comes to habit forming, habits are formed in the three-loop step. Number one, you have the cue. Okay? First, there is a cue. This is the trigger. And then you have the routine or the behavior, if you will. It becomes there. And then it's followed by the reward. Now, you go back to the rat maze that we looked at. And let's be honest, the life that we, the world we're living in, do we not feel like a rat in a maze sometimes? I mean, let's be honest about that. But it, there's a difference between us and that rat and everyone else is that we know who the king is, and that is Jesus Christ. 
Now, without this habit loop, our brains would just shut down. It would be overwhelmed by the busyness of our daily life. So why is the, this loop so important? Here's what I say. When a habit emerges, the brain stops fully participating in the decision making. It stops working so hard and diverts to other tasks. So how do we change a habit? Here's an interesting fact. The golden rule of habit changing, you can't extinguish a bad habit, you can only change it. That will make a world of difference to people right there. And this is where we're trying to get to this morning. If you don't have a good habit of reading your Bible, maybe your bad habit is staying on your phone, staying on social media, whatever it may be. How do you replace that? You, you cannot just get rid of it. It doesn't happen. Studies show that. But you have to replace it. So every time that I want to check social media, why don't I open my Bible app and read the Bible? I can have the cue is I'm wanting to look at something. Okay, I'm going to look at God's word. This is the routine. I become in it. The reward, let me tell you this. The reward of reading God's word is a lot greater than some of the mess that we read on social media. And so that should be something that's in our lives. The longer the habit is in place, the longer it would take to replace it. But how do we change that? Because, again, we all have bad habits that we need to change. Talking to the preacher to start with. Number one, identify the bad habit. Because here, here's the thing. If you're sitting there this morning, well, Pearlyn, I said, you need to be preaching to these people. They, they, they do have some bad habits. Not me. Huh. Was it not Peter who says, Lord, yeah, I understand all these other guys. They may deny you, but not me. I would never do that. Arrogance can get you in trouble. We all have bad habits. Then we have to, after you identify it, you have to identify the cues and the rewards of the habit. Track the time. When is it that I'm faced with this? Whether it's drinking, whether it's smoking, whether it's watching porn or whatever it may be. What time is it? Who am I around? What's going on? Do I have a lot of stress in my life? Is I'm excited about something. What is it that is triggering me to go into this bad habit? And what reward am I pursuing? And when I get this reward, does it relax me? Does it make me where I have less stress? Am I healthier through this or am I happy with this? You think about good habits. When, when you go exercise, how many of us love exercising? I know there's some of you out there. Y'all are, oh, my goodness, y'all kill me. For us that don't like to exercise, uh, Mark, you, you kill me on riding your bike. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, Mark rides 182 miles again today. I'm like, good night. I think I could get to the end of my street and I'd be pushing my bike back. But here's the thing. And I, I'm not knocking you, brother. I'm proud of you. But here's the thing. When I go out and exercise, do I not feel healthier? Do I not feel better about myself? Do I not have a better self-image because the reward is happening? And now I continue that good habit. Am I able to do that? When it comes to reading your Bible, do you read your Bible? Because here, here's something I want you to understand. If only the Bible that you get is when you come to church, you're going to starve to death. Period. We've got to get in God's word daily. Find a replacement, behavior, and routine. When you change the routine, you change the habit. The cue, the reward stays the same, but you've got to change that routine. The bad habit, maybe it's un eating unhealthy snacks. You know, I, I sit in my office and, and I've got uh, snacks there. And, and so if it's unhealthy, okay, when I want an unhealthy snack, why not replace that with an apple? The little things. And you can put this to work in every area of our life. I don't know what your bad habit is. But I know that we all have some that needs to change. And we can see how God works. But repetition is vital. And number five, associate with people of like habits. 
of 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. And I believe the opposite is true too. Good company corrupts evil habits. In order for a habit to stay changed, people have to believe that change is possible. And this belief, this belief emerges with the help of a group or a community. That's why we've said it so many times. Check your circle. Know who's got your back. Just where we started out at today, Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily, so easily entangle us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. My prayer is that we all birth healthy habits. Do you have the habit of reading your Bible? Do you have the habit of going out, asking somebody here at church to go out to eat lunch or come to your house to eat lunch to have that fellowship? Do you have the habit of being involved in a life group? Do you have a habit in having a home study at your house outside of our life groups? Do you have the habit of coming on Wednesday night? Do you have a habit of sitting down and praying to God? And we can go on and on. Do you have a habit, as the Bible talks about, giving back as you have been blessed? There's a lot of habits that we need to have that are good, godly, and healthy in our life. Am I willing to believe that I can do this stuff for the glory of God? But it comes down to a choice. Do you choose To give up those bad habits and replace them with good habits? Or do you think since nobody knows about it, I think the preacher kind of hit on some of this today. But I don't think he really knows my bad habit. And I know the elders don't. And my wife don't even know. My husband don't even know. So maybe nobody. God knows. And those bad habits will catch up with you. So let's make sure as we go into the new year that we have good, godly habits healthy habits that will bring glory to God's name. Let us set aside everything that so easily entangles us and the sin that brings us down. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for your word. And Father, as we've looked at habits, and Father, we know that we all have bad habits, but Father, we just pray that we can birth these new habits. And that the habits that we birth are the ones that can bring glory to your name, that we'll start living in a way that when people see us, they see you living in us. They don't see the bad in us. They don't see and say there's nothing but a bunch of hypocrites there. But they can truly see that we may not be perfect, but we're living a way to bring glory to your name. Father, help us. Help us, Father, to make the choice to do the right things in order to bring glory to your name. For we can hear the wonderful words. Well done, my faithful servant. Father, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If we can help you, you can come. As together we stand and sing.
just a second. I did not warn them of this, so uh, they're like, okay, what's going on? I don't know if you know it or not, but October is clergy slash pastor appreciation month. And we may not call them pastors, but we do call them shepherds and elders. And so we just want to say thank you to you guys. We've got just a little token, not a whole lot, but it means a lot to us and hopefully it means a lot to you. On the front side, it just says, serve your fellow man, do unto others, thank you. Not an act of kindness is ever wasted. And it, on the back, it says, thanks a million. And so we want to present them with this corn and close with a prayer to show our appreciation to them this morning. If you would, let's pray. Our most graceful and all-wise Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the day of worship that we've had. And Father, we just pray that we can put application to your word through the message that was said around the Lord's table, through the prayer, through the songs, and through the message from your word. But Father, as we close out this service, I want to thank you for our shepherds. Father, thank you for Bo, thank you for Philip, thank you for Dale, just what they mean to this congregation, their love for you, their love for your people, and always, always wanting to make sure that they lead in a way that will bring glory to your name. So Father, this morning, we say thank you for allowing these men to be our shepherds and how blessed we are to have them. Father, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Don't forget about our fall festival at 4 o'clock tonight.